All right, for today's class, you have two main things that you're going to be doing. One is going to be creating a timeline of the origin of Earth and then all of the major events that happened throughout the history of life until today or now. Um, that timeline is going to be submitted separately from the lab that we're not really going to do, but we're just going to kind of walk through and explain how it would work. It makes a lot of sense when you just think about it. So we're just going to talk through it and you'll just answer some basic questions to, you know, think about how natural selection works and how different processes will affect um, population genetics over time, like we talked about before, like in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So for the timeline, um, you are going to be looking at this list right here as the events that you're going to be putting down on your paper. And the easiest way to do this timeline is um, to take two sheets of paper and then tape them together, um, not like, lengthwise to lengthwise, both shortwise to shortwise. So for example, if these are your two sheets of paper, you would wanna tape them like this to make one long, long sheet instead of like this. So ideally you would tape them like this together so that you have a long sheet that you can work with. And you wanna measure how many centimeters from one end to the other end that sheet is so that you can divide the total number of years, which would be uh, 4.5 billion years ago. So you want to divide this by however many centimeters you find that your long sheet is. That way you can properly space out when these events are happening based on um, how many centimeters you have and how many years ago they happen. So you're going to make a two scale timeline. And again, the reason why we want to make a two scale timeline is because you want to see how far apart these events happened from the start of the Earth to compared to now where we exist and then also relative to each other. So you're going to make a two scale timeline on your slip of paper. Um, and you must measure the length of the paper so that you can have this tool to help you divide out and see how many years one centimeter represents. I mean, it's going to be a lot of years that each centimeter represents because you're dividing 4.5 billion by however many centimeters you have. So um, you're going to do that. And then you're going to figure out how many years apart and how many centimeters apart on your paper these events belong on. And you're going to label your timeline with each of these event names and how many years ago they were. You don't have to write the numbers though. You can write like uh, for here, it would be 4.5 BYA or billion years ago, 3.5 BYA. And when you get down to the millions, you can write 400 MYA from million years ago for example, to make it shorter instead of writing all of those zeros. So after you label the timeline, just take a picture or um, if you scan it, it's a lot better for me to be able to read it. But if you scan it and then submit it, that would be great. Um, the lab activity that we'd be working on would have been how natural selection works. And this is be a, like a really fun lab to do in person since we'd be pretending to be predators and eating prey, but we don't actually have the ability to do that. And it's really hard to simulate it with just me doing it because it's based on different people having different abilities to pick things up with different tools. So originally in this activity, we, you will simulate interactions of populations of prey and predators. You will study how predators exert selective pressure on prey populations and vice versa, and consider how the environment affects the interaction. The simulated prey are populations of different dry beans, and the simulated predator populations are familiar forceps. And then there's going to be um, different versions of these forceps or these tools that you pick up things with. Um, this experiment tests two hypotheses. One, that prey populations of different forms vary in fitness as a consequence of predation, aka different prey survive better when predators are have different abilities to pick them up. And then we are actually not going to talk about the other hypothesis just because it's obviously not a good scientific experiment if you're testing more than one at a time. Um, if you would work in groups, in person, then you would be having one group act as like a predator species and forage for prey over a time period where we'd set an alarm for. And then you would analyze the changes in prey population numbers after and before to draw conclusions about how valid this hypothesis is that, you know, prey are affected by the predator performance. And so we would have utensils that you'd be using as the predator's um, mouth parts for them to capture prey. And then we'd have different kinds of beans. So the predators would have been like, if you have two knives, two forks, two spoons, and then um, chopsticks or the actual tweezer forceps. Um, and then the beans, there's five kinds, black beans, white beans, lentils, peas, and pinto beans. And then we would be having them in an environment where it's kind of patterned in the background. So let me show you that really quickly. Um, I'll go over these questions again once we get to the end because you're going to answer them later on, I think. And if uh, I miss them, then I'll come back to them. So these are the prey. And so there's gonna be black beans, there's gonna be white beans, 
lentils, which are the smallest, peas, which are large, round, and green, which is an outstanding color after these ones are all neutral colors. And then lastly, pinto beans, which have a little pattern on them. Okay, so the first question I want you to answer is, which type of prey looks like it's the easiest to capture? Right, just physically to pick up using any tool, which one do you think would be the easiest to pick up? So size-wise, I think it goes about the white beans are the biggest, the peas are the second biggest, the pinto beans, the black beans, and then the lentils. Just by size, maybe that helps you, or you can say by color if that is the thing that attracts your attention the most. These are the um, tools that you would have been using in person. So you would have two of these and you would have had them, uh, if you've ever used chopsticks, you would essentially be using them like chopsticks, but you'd have two of them to hold. So there'd be two knives, two spoons, two forks. And then these are the forceps or the tweezers that you'd be using. And then obviously chopsticks are another option. So which tool looks like it's the easiest to pick up prey? So for example, if you were a bird and your beak was a specific shape, which beak looks like it would be the easiest for picking up these bean prey? Now we're taking into consideration that the background is a piece of carpet that looks like this, right? I brought up the pictures of the five prey species again. So your third question is to answer which prey camouflage is the best and which one camouflage is probably the worst, right? You're thinking about as a predator, which one would be the easiest to see and which one would be the hardest to see if you were trying to pick them up to eat. Now we're coming back to the question from before and this one has a part A, B, C, D, which is kind of related to what we said before. So after we, if we were doing the lab, we would be scattering the beans around the little piece of carpet. And then you're answering what prey species do you think would be most able to survive predation and why? Which prey species do you expect to be least successful and why? What is the reasoning behind you picking that prey species as least successful? Um, C says, what predator, oh, sorry. C says, what predator species or utensil type do you expect to be the most successful in capturing prey and why? Um, if you're explaining this and it's based on your own knowledge of your ability to use these tools in a chopstick-like fashion, uh, fashion, that is okay. But you also want to just think about the shape and the convenience. And like, uh, for example, in our daily lives, what kind of tools are used for picking specific types of things up? So like the fork would be like a tractor kind of idea or like, um, a rake versus a spoon, which we usually use for things like liquids, like soup. Um, D is, which predator do you expect to be the least successful and why? So again, this could be based on your skill, but I would like it to be based on the shape of the utensil um, and how you answer this question. So normally we would be um, picking up the prey for a certain period of time and then seeing how many are left over and then preparing the next generation to do it for a couple generations. Um, that's why there's rounds. Um, I just want you to think about this and for number five you're going to do part A and part B. So you're going to rank which prey would survive the best and for five which predator would be best at catching the prey. So you're going to rank them and you're going to rank all five. So I just want to see which ones you think and just logically would be best at surviving. So um, write out the names of all the prey types, all the bean types, and then you're going to rank them numbering five as the best at surviving. So they should have the most left over and one being the worst having the least left over or being the easiest to catch. On the other hand, I also want you to rank the predators at which one would be best at catching prey, right? Which shape is the most likely to pick up all the prey and which one is the least likely to be able to pick up all or a lot of the prey. And then we would be graphing the population sizes for each round and just seeing what happens to each uh, prey species. Um, as time goes on, which prey population will probably decrease in size and will increase, which one will increase in size? Um, you're gonna use your ranking on the last slide where you answered it to decide over time what will happen to the population dynamics if these prey are all living in the same environment, right? Who's gonna have a lot of individuals in their population at the end and who's gonna have very few or maybe be going extinct? So after a while, we would also want to consider about the predators, right? So based on your predator rankings from two slides ago for seven, I'm gonna ask, what do you think would happen to the prey population sizes if all the predators except the best one died out, right? So if only one predator type was left and it was the one that was best at eating overall, 
eating prey or catching prey, what do you think would happen to all of the prey population? Part B is asking, what would happen if all the predators except the worst predators died out? So for example, some kind of natural selection event like uh, a hurricane just happens to wipe out all the predator populations except for the ones that weren't originally good at catching the prey, but by chance they all survived because of where they, um, for example, if they're burrowers and they live underground. So what would happen to um, the prey populations if the predators that were actually the worst at picking them up and catching them were the only ones left to survive? This is a, talking about a general increase or decrease trend and kind of over time maybe what the rankings would change between the prey because just because one type of predator is good at picking up one type of prey doesn't mean that they're all good at picking up all types, right? And that would be it for today. So you're just answering these questions and making sure that you finish up your timeline and then submit it to go ahead and get all your work in and get your extra credit in.